In this Blender video, I'm going to demonstrate how to make this 3D model of a stereo plug adapter. This is modeled after an actual plug adapter that I have. One challenge to modeling based on a real physical object is being able to accurately measure the dimensions of the object. In this video, I'll show you how I use a digital caliper to measure the various dimensions of the object, and I'll also demonstrate how to use these measurements to create this 3D model. A digital caliper is a versatile measurement tool with good accuracy. It can be used to measure the thickness or width of something. It can measure an inside diameter or a distance between two edges. It can measure depth. It can also make step measurements. After doing my research, I ended up buying the eye gauging EasyCal digital caliper and I'm very pleased with it. It's got a nice large display and it measures in millimeters, inches, and inches with a fraction. If you follow the link that I placed in the video description, then you can see the current price and learn more about this digital caliper. But I need to make the disclosure that as an Amazon associate, I earn from qualifying purchases. The Blender version that I'm using is 2.8 beta. Since this is a beta version of Blender, you should be aware that some of the things that I'll be showing might change. Also, version 2.8 is a major update to Blender, so if you're using an earlier version, then many of the things I'll be showing will be different. We're going to start with a new project, so from the File menu select New, and then General. The first thing that we're going to do is set up the units that Blender uses so that it will match the units that the caliper uses. So open the Scene panel, and then open the Units section. The caliper can measure either millimeters or inches. I typically take measurements in inches, but for a change, I'm going to set the caliper to measure in millimeters. In the Unit System drop-down menu, if you're going to use inches, then set this value to Imperial and set the Length value to inches. Since I'm going to use millimeters, I'll set the Unit System to Metric and the Length value to millimeters. Now Blender matches the caliper. We don't need the cube, so select it, and then press X to delete it. Now press Shift A and add a mesh circle. Then open the last operation panel. Here is where you can make changes to an object right after adding it. If you don't see this panel, then from the view menu, add a check mark next to adjust last operation. Currently, the radius of the circle is 1000 millimeters. I'm going to use the caliper now to take a measurement from the plug adapter. Before taking any measurements, I'm going to close the caliper and then push the zero button to zero it out. Now I'll measure the diameter at this point. It's 6.34 millimeters. So I'll enter this value into the radius entry box, but before I press the enter key, I need to take into account the fact that what I measured was the diameter and this entry box is asking for the radius. To convert a diameter value into a radius value, all I need to do is divide by 2. In Blender, this is easy. Just type a forward slash, which means divide, and then type 2. Now when I press the Enter key, Blender divides the diameter value by 2 and displays the radius. Now the circle is a lot smaller, so I'm going to zoom in. You'll notice that if I zoom in too far, then the circle disappears. To fix this, from the View menu, add a check mark next to Sidebar. Then select the View tab and change the Clip Start value to 1. Now you can go to the View menu and remove the check mark from next to Sidebar. Now I can zoom in even farther and it will look fine. Next, tab into Edit Mode and then press A to select all. Next we're going to extrude this circle on the Z-axis so press E, then Z, then pull it up. This value shows how far we extruded it on the Z-axis. Now I'll measure the overall length of the adapter. It measures 45.03 millimeters, and so I'll enter this value here for the Z value. Even though this displays 45 millimeters, if you click it, you can see that it's actually 45.03. Next, I'm going to place a loop cut at the position of this edge. So press Ctrl-R to add a loop cut, left-click to place it here, 
then slide it all the way to the top and left click again to confirm the operation. I moved it all the way to the top so that we can now move it a specific distance from the top. Now move it on the Z axis by pressing G, then Z, then move it down here. This displays how far we moved it. Now I'll use the depth measuring rod at the end of the caliper to measure the distance from the end of the adapter to the black plastic ring. It measures 30.82 millimeters. When I enter in the value, I need to enter it as a negative value since the displayed value is negative. So I'll enter minus 30.82. Next, I'm going to place a loop cut at the position of this edge. So press Ctrl R to add a loop cut, left click to place it here, then slide it all the way to the bottom and left click again to confirm the operation. Now move it on the Z axis by pressing G, then Z, then move it up here. Now I'll take a step measurement from the black plastic ring to the end of the adapter. It measures 1.02 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value here to set the distance. Next, we're going to extrude the plastic piece to give it some thickness. So switch to face select mode. Then hold down the Alt key and left click one of these faces to select the whole ring of faces. When we extrude these faces, we're going to extrude them along the normals. So from the face menu, select extrude faces along normals then extrude outwards. The offset value shows how far it's extruded. Now I'll take a step measurement to find the thickness of the plastic ring at this point. It measures 1.52 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value here to set the thickness. Next, I'm going to place a loop cut at the position of this edge. So press Ctrl R to add a loop cut, put it here and slide it all the way to the bottom and left click. Then move it on the Z axis by pressing G, then Z, then move it up here. Now I'll measure this distance. It measures 8.26 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value here. Next, we're going to extrude the bottom part of the plastic ring to make it thicker. So switch to face select mode. Then hold down the Alt key and left click one of these faces to select the ring of faces. Now from the face menu, select extrude faces along normals. Then extrude outwards. Now I'll take a step measurement to determine how far to increase the thickness. It measures 0.49 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value here to set the thickness. Next, we'll work on the socket part of the adapter that accepts a small stereo plug. So press Shift A and add a circle. Now I'll measure the outside diameter of the socket. It measures 5.96 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value here and divide by 2 since this is a radius value and what I measured was a diameter. Now we'll add a circle for the inside of the socket. So press Shift A and add a circle. Now I'll measure the inside diameter of the socket. It measures 3.54 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value here and again I'll divide by 2. Next, we're going to connect these two circles together. So switch to Edge Select mode. Then with the inside circle still selected, hold down both the Shift key and the Alt key and left click the outside ring to add it to the selection. Then from the Edge menu, select Bridge Edge Loops. Now we'll delete some of the geometry that we don't need. So hold down the Alt key and click this ring of edges to select them. Then hold down both the Shift and Alt keys and click this ring and this ring to add them to the selection. Then press X to delete and select vertices. Now hold down the Alt key and click this ring of edges to select them. We're going to extrude this ring up to the level of this ring. To do this, open the Snapping drop-down menu and select Edge. This will allow us to snap to an edge. 
Now press E to extrude, then Z to restrict the extrusion to the Z axis. Then hold down the control key to enable snapping and place the cursor over this edge. A circle should appear over the edge to indicate that we will be snapping to this edge. Then left click to confirm the operation. Now with this edge still selected, hold down both the shift key and the alt key and click this ring of edges to add them to the selection. Next we're going to use bridge edge loops again to connect this ring of edges to this ring of edges. But if I do it right now, you'll see that something strange happens. To show this, I'll go to the Edge menu and select Bridge Edge Loops. You can see that it didn't connect the edges the way that we would expect. There are edges crossing each other. I'll press Ctrl Z to undo this, and then I'll show you how to make it work as expected. What we need to do is to recalculate the normals before doing the Bridge Edge Loops. So press A to select all. Then from the Mesh menu, select Normals, and then Recalculate Outside. Now hold down the Alt key and select this ring of edges. Then hold down the Shift key and the Alt key and click this ring of edges to add them to the selection. Now from the Edge menu, select Bridge Edge Loops. Now it looks good. Now let's finish the hole in the middle. So hold down the Alt key and click this inside edge to select it. Then press F to add a face. Now press E to extrude and drag it up. This is a good time to save what I have so far. I'm going to name it adapter.blend. Now we're going to add loop cuts here, 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 and here. I'll be making all of the measurements from this point. So press Ctrl R to add a loop cut and left click here. Then slide it all the way to the bottom and left click again to confirm the operation. Now move it up on the Z axis by pressing G, then Z, then drag it up here. This is how far I moved it. This distance measures 27.46 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value here. Now we'll do it again. Press Ctrl R to add a loop cut and slide it to the bottom. Then press G, then Z, then drag it up here. This distance measures 24.8 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value. In the interest of time, I'll do the next five loop cuts more quickly. So I'll add a loop cut and then move it up. The measured value is 23.28 millimeters. I'll add another loop cut and drag it up. The measured value is 22.32 millimeters. I'll add another loop cut and drag it up. The measured value is 21.03 millimeters. I'll add another loop cut and drag it up. The measured value is 15.9 millimeters. I'll add the last loop cut and drag it up. The measured value is 14.91 millimeters. Now let's work on the tip of the adapter and so I'll zoom in on it. I'll select this top ring of edges by holding down the Alt key while I click on one of the edges. To set the size of this ring, it might seem like all that I need to do is to press S in order to scale this down in size. While this does change the size, the values that we can set are percentage values. So for example, if I set both the X and Y values to 0.5, then the size of the circle will be 50% of its original size. While we could do some math to determine what percentage values to use, I'll show you a different method. So start by moving the 3D cursor to the center of this ring by pressing Shift-S and then select Cursor to Selected. 
Now press Shift A and add a circle. I'll measure the diameter at the tip. It measures 1.98 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value here and divide by 2 since this is a radius value. Now press F to add a face to the circle. Next, hold down both the Shift key and the Alt key and click one of these edges to add the whole ring to the selection. Then from the Edge menu, select Bridge Edge Loops. Next, add a check mark next to Merge to merge these two rings together. Then you can use the Merge Factor setting to control whether you merge to the outside ring, the inside ring, or something in between. I'm going to merge to the inside ring since that's the measured circle that I just added. Next, hold down the Alt key and select this ring of edges. Then press S to scale and scale it down in size. It doesn't matter how small you make it because we're going to adjust its size later. Next, we're going to adjust the radius of some of the different sections of the adapter. That's because the radius of this section is not the same as this section, or this section, or this section. And the radius of this insulating ring is different than this one. In fact, none of these sections are the same. But the caliper has a zero function that can help us to adjust things. The very first ring that we made when we started modeling was the radius of this section. So we're going to adjust the various sections based on the size of this section. To do that, I'll first measure the size of this section. Now I'll press the zero button so that the caliper will read zero at this point. Now when I measure the other sections of the adapter, the caliper will show us how much larger or smaller it is compared with this section. Let's start by adjusting the size of the insulating rings. So switch to face select mode. Then hold down the Alt key and left click to select this ring of faces. Then from the face menu, select extrude faces along normals. Then extrude inward. Now I'll measure this ring. It's 0.14 millimeters smaller. We're going to enter that number here, but first notice whether the offset is positive or negative. Since it's positive, we're going to enter our measured value as a positive value. So I'll enter 0.14. Also, our measured value is a diameter value and the offset is based on radius, and so I'll divide by 2. Now hold down the Alt key and left click to select the other insulating ring. Then from the face menu, select Extrude Faces Along Normals. Then extrude inward. Now I'll measure this ring. It's 0.38 millimeters smaller, and so I'll enter that value and divide by 2. Now hold down the Alt key and select this ring of faces. We changed the size of the two insulating rings by extruding them because that added more geometry to them at the edges. We're going to be pushing these faces in a little, but we don't need any extra geometry. So from the Mesh menu, select Transform, then Shrink Fatten. Then push the faces inward. We're using shrink fatten instead of scaling it because shrink fatten allows us to enter an offset value. If you recall, when you scale something, it uses percentage values. Now I'll measure this ring. It's 0.18 millimeters smaller, and so I'll enter that value and divide by 2. Now hold down the Alt key and select this ring of faces. Then from the Mesh menu, select Transform, and then Shrink Fatten. Then push the faces inward. Now I'll measure this ring. It's 0.36 millimeters smaller, and so I'll enter that value and divide by 2. Now let's add a subdivision surface modifier, and then we'll adjust the radius here and here. So tab into Object Mode. Then switch to the Modifiers panel and add a Subdivision Surface Modifier. Set the Render and Viewport values to 3. Then right-click the adapter and select Shade Smooth. Now tab back into Edit Mode. When you use a Subdivision Surface Modifier, the radius of the new smooth surface doesn't always match the original geometry very well, especially in areas like this and this. 
so I'll show you a method that you can use in these areas. We'll start by adding a couple of circles that we'll use as a reference. So switch to Edge Select Mode. Then hold down the Alt key and select this ring of edges. Then move the 3D cursor to the center of this ring by pressing Shift S and then select Cursor to Selected. Now press Shift A and add a circle. I'll measure the diameter at this point. Since I changed the zero point of the caliper earlier, I need to close it and re-zero it first. The diameter measures 5.89 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value and divide by 2. Now let's add another circle here that we'll use as a reference. So that we can see through the smooth surface, click the Show Whole Screen Transparent button. Now hold down the Alt key and select this ring of edges. Then move the 3D cursor to the center of this ring by pressing Shift S and then select Cursor to Selected. Now press Shift A and add a circle. I'll measure the diameter at this point. It measures 3.8 millimeters, and so I'll enter that value and divide by 2. Now click the Show Whole Screen Transparent button again. Next we're going to add a loop cut, so press Ctrl R and put a loop cut here. Then switch to Face Select mode, hold down the Alt key, and select this ring of faces. Now I'll zoom in. Next, press S to scale, and scale it until the smooth surface is even with the reference circle. Now let's adjust this section. So click the Show Whole Screen Transparent button. Then switch to Edge Select mode. Then hold down the Alt key and select this ring of edges. Now click the Show Whole Screen Transparent button again. If you don't see the reference circle, then press S to scale and scale it down. Now press 1 on the number pad for front view. Then move it on the Z axis by pressing G, then Z, then move it until the minimum width of the smooth surface is centered with the reference circle. Now rotate the view down a little. Now press S to scale and scale it until the smooth surface is even with the reference circle. We're done with the two reference circles, so let's remove them. To do that, make sure that Edge Mode Select is selected. Then from the Select menu, choose Select All by Trait, and then Loose Geometry. Then press X to delete, and select Vertices. Next, let's flatten the top. So switch to Face Select Mode, and select the top face. Now press I for inset and inset it slightly. If you look closely, you can see some ripples around the edge. So press I and inset it again. Now it looks better. Now we're going to add some materials and we're also going to add some loop cuts to sharpen some of the edges. So press Z and select Look Dev so that we can get an idea of what this will look like before we set up the lighting. Now switch to the Material panel and click the New button. We'll keep the principled shader. Set the metallic value to 1 to make this a metal material. We're going to add a small amount of roughness, so set the roughness value to 0 0.05. Then change the base color to a hex value of B2 9F96. Now we'll add another material for the insulating rings. So hold down the Alt key and select this ring of faces. Then click this plus button to add a new material, and then click the new button. Now click the assign button to assign this material to the selected faces. Now set the base color to black. Keep the metallic value set to zero because this is not a metallic material. We want the material to be glossy, so set the roughness value to zero. You'll notice that the new material doesn't extend all the way to the top and bottom of the selected faces. 
So we're going to add some loop cuts to fix this. So press Ctrl R, add a loop cut here, and slide it all the way up. Then press Ctrl R to add another loop cut and slide it all the way to the bottom. Now let's add a few more loop cuts to sharpen some edges. So add a loop cut here and slide it up a little. Then add another one here and slide it down a little. Then add another one and slide it here. Next, let's work on the other insulating ring. So switch to face select mode. Then hold down the Alt key and select this ring of faces. Then click the Assign button to assign the material to the selected faces. Then add a loop cut here and slide it all the way up. Then add another loop cut and slide it all the way down. Now add a loop cut above the ring and slide it here. Then add another loop cut below the ring and slide it here. Next we'll work on the black plastic ring. So switch to face select mode. Hold down the Alt key and select this ring of faces. We're selecting these faces because they are at the center of the plastic ring. Now hold down the Control key and press the plus key on the number pad two times to select more connected faces. If you don't have a number pad, then from the Select menu, go to Select More Less and choose More. You'll need to do this twice. Now click this plus button to add another material and then click the New button. Then click the Assign button to assign this material to the selected faces. Now set the base color to black. Then set the roughness to 0 0.4. This material is extending up here too high, so press Ctrl R to add a loop cut and slide it all the way down. Then add another loop cut here and slide it all the way in. We'll do this at the bottom also. So add a loop cut here and slide it all the way up. Then add another loop cut here and slide it all the way in. Now sharpen this bottom edge by adding a loop cut here and slide it outward until it's close to the outside. Then sharpen this top edge by adding a loop cut here and slide it outward until it's close to the outside. Now add a loop cut here and slide it near the top to sharpen this edge. Now add a loop cut here and slide it near the bottom to sharpen this edge. Next, add a loop cut here and slide it outward until it's close to the outside. Now let's sharpen the edges at the bottom of the metal socket. So add a loop cut on the bottom and slide it outward until it's close to the outside. Then add another loop cut to the bottom and slide it inward, but don't slide it too far because the inside edge is not as sharp. Then add a loop cut to the inside and slide it down to about here. This is a good time to save what I have so far. The black plastic ring has a texture on the surface and so we'll add that now. So switch to the shading workspace. I'm going to zoom in on the adapter and a quick way to do that is to press the period key on the number pad. If you don't have a number pad, then from the view menu select frame selected. If I zoom in further, it will disappear, but I can bring it back by clicking this button to switch to orthographic view. To add a texture, press Shift A and select Texture and then Noise Texture. Then press Shift A again and select Vector. Here you'll find Vector Displacement and Displacement. Select Displacement. Then connect the Displacement Output to the Displacement Input. Then connect the Factor Output to the Height Input. Now change the Noise Texture Scale value to 200 to make the texture smaller. The texture that we're trying to achieve is not very strong, 
And so I'm going to enter a very small value for the displacement scale value. I'm going to use 0 0.00005. Even though this displays zero, if you click it, you can see that it accepted the small value that I entered. Part of the black plastic ring has a grid pattern on it. We're going to add this by using a grid texture. To do this, switch to face select mode, hold down the Alt key, and select this ring of faces. We're going to add a new material to these faces. So switch to the material panel. Then click this plus button to add a new material, and then click the new button. Now click the assign button to assign this material to the selected faces. This new material will be similar to the previous material that we just made, so let's copy the previous material. So select the previous material. Then click this button and select copy material. Now select the new material that we just added. Then click this button and select Paste Material. We don't need the noise texture for this material, so select it and press X to delete it. Now press Shift A and select Texture and then Image Texture. Connect the color output to the height input. I'm going to be using this image of a grid that I created using Inkscape. You can find a link to it in the video description. Now click the Open button and select the Adapter Grid image. Next we need to unwrap these faces, so switch to Edge Select mode. Then rotate the view to the back and select one of these edges. Then from the Edge menu select Mark Seam. Now I'll rotate the view back to the front. Next, switch to Face Select mode. Hold down the Alt key and select this ring of faces. Then press U to unwrap and select Unwrap. Now change the scale value to 0 .001. Next we need to scale the unwrapped faces so that they will fit the image that we're using. So switch to the UV editing workspace. Now press A to select all. Then rotate it by pressing R, then 90, then Enter. We're going to adjust the size of the selected faces to match the size of the image. So move it on the x-axis by pressing G, then X, then drag it to the center. To make this easier, from the UV menu, add a check mark next to Constrain to Image Bounds. This will prevent the selected faces from moving outside of the image. Now press S to scale and scale it up in size until it won't get any bigger. Then press G to move and center it. Then press S to scale and scale it up in size again until it won't get any bigger. Next, switch to the layout workspace. Then press Tab for edit mode. Now we'll add a couple of loop cuts to adjust the position of the top and bottom of the grid. So add a loop cut here and slide it up a short distance until the grid is near the top and there is a border between the grid and the top edge. Then add another loop cut and do the same thing for the bottom edge. We're done making the adapter, so tab back into object mode. I'm going to position this so that it's lying on a flat surface. So press 1 on the number pad for front view. Then press R to rotate. If you set the angle to 94 degrees, then it should work well. Now we'll add a surface for it to sit on. So press Shift A and add a mesh plane. Then press G to move and drag it down to the bottom of the adapter. For the material, click the New button and set the base color to a hex value of A4, A4, A4. Then scale it up in size by pressing S, then 100, then Enter. Next we'll set up the camera view, so press 0 on the number pad for camera view. This is the view looking through the camera. I'll zoom in a little. Now I'm going to lock the camera to the view. To do that, press N to open the sidebar, select the View tab, and put a check mark next to Lock Camera to View. Then press N again to close the sidebar. 
Now I can zoom, pan, and rotate while looking through the camera. Since this is going to be a close-up view of a small object, let's change the camera focal length. So find the camera in the outliner and select it. Then switch to the object data panel if it's not already selected and change the focal length to 200. Now I'm going to pause the video while I set up the view that I'd like to use. I'm finished setting up the view. Next, let's set up the lighting. Some of the lighting settings are different for different render engines, so we'll select the render engine now. So select it by switching to the render panel and then select Cycles. Now find the light in the outliner and select it. Then switch to the object data panel. Make sure the point lamp is selected and set the size to 3000 millimeters. Then set the power to 3000. Now switch to the object panel. So that you can position the lamp at the same location that I use, I'm going to enter the location values here. So set the location X value to 1000, the Y value to 150, and the Z value to 5800. To see what this looks like, press Z and then Rendered. Reflective surfaces like the metal in this adapter generally look better when they have something to reflect. So we're going to add an image to the background. To do that, switch to the World panel. Then click this small button next to Color and select Environment Texture. Then click the Open button and select an image. I'm going to use this image. It's common to use a 360 degree image for an environment texture, but since I'm only using it to give the adapter something to reflect, an image like this will work just fine. You can find a link to it in the video description. This image is named Outdoors.jpg. Now the reflections look better. Everything looks good, so we're ready to set this up for the final render. So switch to the output panel. This is where you can set the resolution of the rendered image and the file format. I'm going to keep all of the default values. Now switch to the render panel. The sampling section is where you set the number of render samples. The larger this value is, the better the final image will look, but the longer it will take to render. I'm going to set it to 300. Now I'm going to save the project. It's a good idea to do this before rendering in case something goes wrong during the rendering process. Now we'll render the image, so from the Render menu, select Render Image. This is going to take several minutes to render, and so I'll pause the video until it's done. Rendering is finished, and this is the final image. To save the image, go to the Image menu and select Save As. I'm going to name this image Adapter.png. Well that concludes this video, thanks for watching, and please subscribe and leave a comment.